Attention, the following names of people and places are most likely about to be completely butchered by my Midwestern American pronunciations. Side effects may include cringe or humor. The choice is yours. When you hear the name Chanel, what comes to mind? For me, it's the double C's logo and the iconic little black dress. I love a great hat, too. The world-famous brand has been around for decades. It seems to be the epitome of style, class, and sophistication. The founder, Gabrielle Bonheur Chanel, or Coco, as we know her, was a woman born in poverty who used her skills with a needle and a man's affections to develop a brand. No, a lifestyle for the glitterati around the world. But... What if I told you that the founder of the luxurious brand had ties to not only working with Nazis, but being romantically involved and living with one during the war? Not just a Nazi, but a Nazi officer. She would spy for him against her own countryman and humanity. We all have that instinct of self-preservation but I believe it is a pretty rotten thing to do if that means that countless others will suffer. The trolley problem I've mentioned before comes to mind when I think of this. You can divert the track to save one person you love or save five people you don't know. None of us honestly know what we're capable of until we ourselves are in that type of situation. Some of us may be more rotten than we're aware of. Yet... Today's lesson will be about the early life, career, lovers, and wrongdoings of Coco Chanel and her battle for self-preservation, and how it sent her down a path of greed, lies, and betrayal. I am your host, Joshua Waters, and this is Rotten to the Core. Thank you all for joining me. I am very excited about today's lesson. Now, attendance is in. Elbows off the table and sit up straight, because this history class is in session. Our story takes us to the year 1883 in the adorable town of Salmer, France. It is August 19th, and a young baby girl named Gabrielle Bonheur Chanel was just born. Ahead of her will be a life most would only dream about, along with some nightmares this baby will eventually redefine the fashion industry. Her family was impoverished, to say the least. Her father would sell clothes as a traveling street vendor, and her mother was a laundress at a charity hospital. The two would struggle to support their family, and they often lived in dire conditions, traveling often for the father to find work. Fun fact, Coco's real last name was Chesnel. But due to her mom being too ill and her father out of town, the birth certificate was misspelled. She even went to her death with that name as she didn't want to legally change it and be found out that she was born in a poorhouse. She was one of six children living often in one-bedroom places along with her parents. It would give her a great desire to be something better. A quote from her later in life, Whoever said money can't buy happiness didn't know where to go shopping. Girl, I know that's right. At the young age of 11, Gabrielle lost her mom to illness and her father, being unable to afford or know how to care for six children, sent the boys to a working farm and the girls to a convent, which had an orphanage ran by nuns. Its religious order, the Congregation of the Sacred Heart of Mary, was founded to care for the poor and rejected, including running homes for abandoned and orphaned girls. If anyone knows how orphanage were run at that time, some still to this day, it was a simple life with very strict religious discipline. But for the young fashion icon, this would be the step she needed. It was at the orphanage that she learned how to sew from the nuns, giving her the exact knowledge she would use to pull herself out from poverty and into the life she dreamed of. At the age of 18, after aging out of the orphanage, Gabrielle would then move into a female boarding house for Catholic girls in the town of Moulin. When she later speaks of her childhood, Coco would often embellish, stating that her father moved to America to seek his fortune, 
and even lying about being born a decade later than she was. She was constantly ashamed of her childhood and tried hard to erase it from her story. While living at the boarding house, Gabrielle found work as a seamstress during the day and at night became a cabaret singer in a place often filled with cavalry officers. This would be a dream life for me, I think. I get to sew and sing for military men. Yes, please, and thank you. It would be while she was a singer that she would earn the name Coco, as she would often sing, Who has seen Coco? Though she would falsely state later that her father gave her the nickname. Coco had a way about her while singing that drove the men crazy. But after several failed auditions, she soon realized that a stage career just wasn't in the cards for her. Often being visually appealing, her singing voice just wasn't strong enough for that type of success. Her first real love was an ex cavalry officer and textile heir, Etienne Balsan, and she soon became his mistress at the age of 23. Now, this is definitely a woman who knows how to marry up. Raise your standards, people. Get you a man with an inheritance. She lived with him for three years at his Chateau Royleau near Compagne, an area known for its beautiful wooded horse trails and hunting. It's her relationship with Etienne where Coco developed her taste for the finer things, often being gifted jewels, clothing, and enjoying decadent parties. Once she got a taste of this world, she developed a larger hunger to not only stay, but to thrive in it. In 1908, Coco started having an affair with one of Etienne's friends, Captain Arthur Edward Capel. Later in her life, she would joke about how she had two men outbidding each other over her hot little body. Get it, girl. She knew what she had, and she knew how to use it to get all of her desires. Coming from a wealthy English upper-class family, Capel would move Coco into an apartment in Paris and even bankrolled her first shops. Even his personal style was a significant influence on Chanel and her future brand. The bottle of the iconic Chanel Eau de Toilette was a replica of the whiskey decanter Capel used. In 1918, Chanel purchased the building at 31 Rue Campon in one of the most fashionable districts in Paris. In 1921, she opened an early version of a fashion boutique featuring clothing, hats, and accessories, which later expanded to offer jewelry and fragrances. By 1927, Chanel owned five properties on the Rue Cambon, buildings numbered 23 to 31. Being ever elusive about her true beginnings, Coco's name even had several origin stories attached to it. The ones mentioned above from the song she would often sing at cabarets, another story was given to her by her father, and another that it is from the French word for a kept woman, coquette, and that she most definitely was. Throughout her life, Coco would collect a fantastic array of lovers, losing each one either to another woman or death. She was a passionate French woman, endlessly searching for her partner and passion. Apart from being kept aspect, men tend to think that when they pay for you, they get to make your decisions as well. But I can definitely see the draw Coco felt for this lifestyle. But our mademoiselle was no fool. She gave those men her love, and in return, they funded her creativity and collections. She was with a Russian composer, Igor Stravinsky, which led her to make the costumes for the ballet for over a decade. This lady found advancement in every relationship she made. Coco Chanel was known not only as an avant-garde designer, but she was a bit of a party girl as well. By 1935, she had become addicted to using drugs to cope with her daily life and demands, using cocaine to stay driven and keep up with demand, and then injecting herself with morphine at night to get some rest before starting the cycle all over again the next morning. Bus, club, another club, plane, next place, no sleep, no fear. Was there not one successful person in this time period who wasn't soaring high on booger sugar? No, I figured as much. 
as I sip my third energy drink of the day. In 1923, cocoa was introduced to a man named Hugh Richard Arthur Grosvenor, the Duke of Westminster. This relationship filled with opulence, expensive gifts, jewels, and real estate lasted for over a decade, leaving Coco with more money and notoriety among the aristocrats, as well as further hatred towards Jews and people, believe it or not, like me, the homosexuals. Coco Chanel was known for her disdain of gay men, and I believe it was a jealous hate based on this quote from her. Homosexuals? I have seen young women ruined by these awful queers. Drugs, divorce, scandal. They will use any means to destroy a competitor and to wreak vengeance on a woman. The queers want to be women. But they are lousy women. They are charming. They were gay, but as men they still had more standing in the world than her as a successful woman. I believe her hatred towards us was like every other form of homophobia at its core. Don't hate us because you ain't us. When later asked why she didn't marry the Duke of Westminster, Coco simply replied with, There have been several duchesses of Westminster. There is only one Chanel. Oh mon dieu. I wish I had some of her confidence. Hmm. So, I think I will. Looks like I found my lesson from her story. No matter what faces us, let's have some of the confidence of Coco Chanel. By 1935, she had a thriving business with around 4,000 employees. As the 1930s progressed, her place on the throne of haute couture was threatened. The boyish look and the short skirts of the 20s flapper seemed to just disappear overnight. Her designs for film stars in Hollywood were not as successful as she had hoped. She saw the world of film in California as infantile, and she dressed the stars as women, but the films wanted them to be two women. Her designs just didn't translate into film the way that she had hoped. It would all come to a halt on September 3, 1939, due to Britain's declaration of war. Chanel closed all of her stores, even with protest from her clientele, simply stating, It is not a time for fashion. The only sales she would make during the war were solely off of her perfume. In closing her couture house, Chanel made a definitive statement about her political views. Her dislike of Jews, reportedly sharpened by her association with society elites, had solidified her beliefs. She shared with many of her circle a conviction that Jews were a threat to Europe because of the Bolshevik government in the Soviet Union. Always keeping with her kept woman image, she saw a relationship opportunity that would guarantee her safety during the war. She lived at the Hotel Ritz in Paris during the war and along with all the upper German military staff in Paris including one Baron Hans Gunther von Dinklage, a German aristocrat, diplomat, officer, and attorney general. Chanel wants no scrubs. She collects men with titles like I collect men with commitment issues. Does she have a, uh, a kept woman masterclass somewhere? I'll pay. Further pushing her stance against Jewish people, She took advantage of the Nazi seizure of all Jewish businesses, attempting to take full ownership of her perfume and sales away from her Jewish partners and director of Perfume Chanel, the Werthermeyers. She wrote, I have an indisputable right of priority. The profits that I have received for my creation since the foundation of this business are disproportionate and you can help to repair in part the prejudices I have suffered in these 17 years. What she was not aware of, though, was that the Werthermeyers, anticipating the forthcoming Nazi mandates against Jews, had, in May of 1940, legally turned over control of Perfume Chanel over to Félix Amois, a Christian French businessman and industrialist. At war's end, he returned the Chanel perfume label back in their hands. Ultimately, they did come to mutual accommodation 
renegotiating the original 1924 contract, and on May 17, 1947, Chanel received wartime profits from the sale of Chanel No. 5, an amount equivalent to about $12 million today. Her future share would be 2% of all of Chanel No. 5's sales worldwide, making her one of the wealthiest women in the world at that time. In addition, Pierre Werthmeyer agreed to an unusual stipulation proposed by Chanel herself. He agreed to pay for all of her living expenses for the rest of her life. F7124 is the codename given to the French spy for Nazi intelligent, but we know her as Coco Chanel. She would spy for the Nazis and is believed to at least have done one secret mission under the guise of fashion. It is not fully known what her exact involvement was or to what extent with the Nazis. What we do know is that whatever she did, she did it willingly and under no threat to her person. When the Nazi occupation of France began, Chanel decided to close her stores. However, she moved into the same Hotel Ritz that was housing all those German military men. Her motivation became very apparent. While many women in France were punished for horizontal collaboration with German officers, Chanel faced no such action. At the time of the French liberation in 1944, Chanel left a note in her store window explaining Chanel No. 5 to be free to all GIs. During this time, she fled to Switzerland to avoid criminal charges for her collaboration as a Nazi spy. She ended up staying there for nine years in her self-imposed exile. In late 2014, French intelligence agencies declassified and released documents confirming Coco Chanel's role with Germany in World War II. Working as a spy, Chanel was directly involved in a plan for the Third Reich to take control of Madrid. In September 1944, Chanel was interrogated by the Free French Purge Committee. The committee had no documented evidence of her collaboration, activities, and was obliged to release her. But according to Chanel's grandniece, when Chanel returned home, she said, Winston Churchill had me freed. It would seem that her relationship with the Duke was still benefiting her. The Chanel group has stated, What is certain is that she had a relationship with a German aristocrat during the war. Clearly, it wasn't the best period to have a love story with a German, even if Baron von Dinklage was English by his mother and Chanel knew him before the war. That sounds to me a lot like, yeah, she did it, but... Look how pretty this dress is. At more than 70 years old, after having her couture house closed for 15 years, she felt the time was right for her to re-enter the fashion world. The revival of her couture house in 1954 was fully financed by Chanel's opponent in the perfume battle, Pierre Werthmeyer. She had a way of making, even though she tried to screw over, pay for all of her thoughts' desires. Her new collection, though, was rejected by the French, but Chanel knew she was right. Then taking it to the United States, it was viewed as a breakthrough, and orders started to pour in for the then 70-year-old designer. Chanel had become tyrannical and extremely lonely late in life. In her last years, she was sometimes accompanied by close, longtime friends and still resided at the Hotel Ritz. When she did leave, it was usually for a lovely stroll with a friend through central Paris. That is literally my dream retirement there. Oh, what'd you do today? Oh, I just strolled through Paris and then went back home for tea and a nap. Oh, someone's gotta do it. As 1971 began, Chanel was 87 years old tired and ailing. She carried out her usual routine of preparing the spring catalog, and she had gone for a long drive on the afternoon of Saturday, the 9th of January. Soon after, feeling ill, she went to bed early. 
she announced her final words to her maid, which were, You see, this is how you die. And she died on Sunday, January 10th, 1971, at the Hotel Ritz, where she had resided for more than 30 years. Her funeral was held at the Iglesia de la Madeleine. Her fashion models occupied the first seats during the ceremony, and her coffin was covered with white flowers, camellias, gardenias, orchids, azaleas, and just a few red roses. Salvador Dali, Serge Lafarge, Jacques Chazot, Yves Saint Laurent, and Marie-Hélène de Rothschild attended her funeral in the Church of the Madeleine. Her grave is at the Bordeaux-Vau Cemetery in Lusier, Switzerland. I will leave it up to you all to choose the image of Chanel that you wish to make. Before this, I saw her as only an eccentric designer who created beautiful pieces of art. I still do, but also I see her as a usually selfish person who would do anything in her power to succeed and survive. A trait all of us honestly have at our core. This is a woman who produced both beauty and darkness upon the earth, not only with her use of her favorite color, black, and her designs, but also with the rotten decision she chose against the Jewish people. I hope from this lesson we walk away with a bit of her confidence, but none of her faux pas. Remember, just because we don't like someone, that gives us no right to meddle in their lives and their happiness. You do you and keep letting others do them. I am Josh Waters, and this has been another episode of Rotten to the Core. Let's do something nice for someone today. If you would like to stay up to date on our current episodes of Rotten to the Core or have suggestions for future ones, please follow and like us on Facebook at It's Rotten to the Core, Instagram at It's Rotten to the Core, Twitter at Rotten in History, it's RottenToTheCore.com. We also have a Patreon if you would like to support the podcast at Patreon.com slash It's Rotten to the Core. Check out some of our other podcasts too at It's ArcLightMedia.com. Au revoir.